Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeremiah Grossman, and thank you very much for the warm introduction. Uh, thank you for being here at a, it's not only at the conference itself, um, but a part of the application security industry. Um, the work we do in this industry is very, very important, and it's also extremely difficult. Um, I'm, I'm fond of saying that there are no application security experts in the world because an expert might mean you know a lot about the space. Um, it seems, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years or so, and I'm, I think I not only know a slice, I, I think my experience now has shown me how much I know I don't know, and there's other uh, four-letter words that you can describe that with. But, uh, so I really depend on the input and the feedback and the contributions of others to keep myself relevant out there in the industry, which is why I, I come to uh, apps like Cali, or I go to the, the main OWASP conferences. But uh, these days, actually, uh, you know, since I've been traveling pretty heavy the last 15 years, I actually don't go to many conferences anymore, maybe one a month or maybe, maybe and if I'm speaking. So if you see me leave Hawaii and speak, it's probably because I you know, find it important that I get to impart some knowledge on people. So uh, I was, uh, I got into web security, which were two words you actually never saw uh, next to each other back in about 1999, uh, where I was, uh, I think I was like, the first one that hacked Yahoo Mail. And uh, several times, and they were kind enough to give me a job there to hack everything that they had. And the things that I learned there is uh, what prepared me to start White Hat and try to solve some of these very large web security problems. And I think our space is probably, in all of InfoSec, by far the most important and by far the most challenging. Imagine, we have to secure software. Like, that's the, the most crazy difficult challenge that there is. And there, at the time, there was no books. Um, I'll go through these things um, there. There were no books on the subject. There were no white papers. There were things here and there. Um, actually, who remembers the date that SQL injection was first written about? Does anybody remember that one? That was Christmas Day, 1998. So we've been dealing with SQL injection for nearly two decades now. It's still not quite solved. And it's not, quite, it's not solved for a number of reasons, mostly because it's a legacy issue. In AppSec, we deal with application security problems in two ways. There's those who give talks or do their work on code that's yet to be written. We must do uh, security in the software development life cycle. That implies that they're starting from today where no software is written, and they're gonna try to secure new code going in. But by the time most of you get into web security, the web is already one billion websites strong and untold number of applications. And so a lot of the risk that we see in application security comes from the legacy issues. So in a lot of ways, like, you know, we find ourselves in a web security janitorial world and we're trying to clean things up. And what I find is that, let's say over the last, uh, you know, let's say the last eight years, 10 years, something like that, you see hack after hack after hack, breach after breach after breach, right? You guys all see the, read the same news that I do. Can you, anybody describe for me a, a vulnerability, a major breach where the vulnerability was not understood, the class of attack we could not predict, we could not find this vulnerability, we didn't know how to prevent this vulnerability, have we seen a single one? We know how those work, though. We know how you know memory handling works in different things. They might show up in different ways, but you're right. That's probably one of the, the rare nuances. Probably one in the last ten years. But by far, we're we're dealing with known problems, and we still can't solve them. I think to myself here, it's that it's not a technology issue: lack of solutions, lack of scanners, lack of web application firewalls. We have lack of incentives in the system to actually do software security because we know what we're doing. We know how to make websites secure, generally speaking, but we aren't doing it for a variety of reasons. So I'm gonna get into all these things. Uh, so rules of the road here. I'm going to challenge conventional wisdom. Uh, I'm gonna say things that are probably fairly controversial in the industry and the vendors are not gonna like it. Um, I do not care. <laughs> um, but if you have questions at any time, please ask. Uh, there's people, uh, if, if you look around the room, if you have asked, there's uh, microphones in the room. So just raise your hand, they'll give you the mic and I'll be happy to take questions at any time. So a little bit about White Hat, and it's not to, you know, vendor pitch or anything like that, just to give you a sense of uh, the company, uh, how long we've been around, how big we are, things like that. Uh, I guess in just normal terms, our job is to find the vulnerabilities in websites that the bad guys will eventually exploit. And the whole idea of vulnerability assessment or pen testing, if you prefer, is to increase the difficulty that the bad guy uh, is going to experience while breaking into the system. If we do our job, the website is just that much more secure. Uh, I mean, harder to break in, which is the entire idea. Uh, all throughout the presentation and by the end, I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of data. So 
White Hat is over a thousand customers, but more to the point on that, we know who's vulnerable to what and how often. And if you're familiar with our statistics reports, which we've been releasing since 2006, we're sharing the broad trends of the industry as we see it. You know, how many, what, what are the odds that a website will have SQL injection? How long will they remain open? So we share this data out there, so we start spying trends and learning about these things. And maybe we start counteracting them a little bit better. Now, web security is very broad. I do like the, the nitty gritty detail of getting down in the guts. I've been uh, fortunate enough to do some nice research on whether it's click jacking, uh, business logic flaws, uh, browser internet hacking, all sorts of things. But now I'm kind of taking a larger focus, not so much, so much of the deep tech, but looking at concepts. These are my personal areas of focus um, where I think I can make the most impact. Uh, I want to understand the threat actors. I want to understand if they are innovating or scaling or both. Now that's important. So are the bad guys innovating? Meaning, Do they have to find new attack techniques and new vulnerabilities in order to achieve their goal, to hack into the system? Or do we see them more scaling, meaning taking well-known issues and broadening out their attacks across the larger web? Um, I think in web security, the bad guys are mostly scaling because the web is very large. Most of the sites are riddled with vulns. There was just recently an article, somebody was just randomly looking at military websites and finding SQL injection everywhere. So the bad guys, I think, are scaling, which means to us that whatever our guidance is, you know, so, you know product solution, process, or whatever, they have to be able to outscale what the bad guys are accomplishing. So I look at the threat actors and what they're up to. Um, I also want to look at the intersection of security guarantees and cyber insurance. I'm going to really harp on the, those two, si intersection of security guarantees and cyber insurance, because cyber insurance will impact, it won't be today, it won't be tomorrow, probably within the next three to five years, it will dictate what our entire industry does. We're going to have new masters in this whole space, whether we like it or not. So I'll get into that. Um, we're gonna, how do we ease the burden of vulnerability remediation? Um, our, the web security industry of which, or let's say vulnerability assessment, which White Hat is a part, we have buried enterprises in vulnerabilities. We have no problem spotting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities annually, and we bury development teams in vulnerabilities. What we're not terribly good at is fixing these issues. So in the grand scheme of things, what good is it if we're gonna find millions of vulns and only fix half of them? And let's be mindful, the bad guys only have to you know, exploit one to win. And so right now we have this dichotomy. You go to a dev team, do they fix the revenue, I mean, do they create revenue generating features that if the business doesn't deploy, will cost them money, or do they fix vulnerabilities that may get exploited and may cost the company money? And we already know what they choose nine times out of 10. How do we reduce the burden and the cost of vulnerability remediation? We do that, you'll actually make a meaningful, measurable difference in web security. And uh, this is where I spend a lot of my time trying to figure this out. Uh, fourth, and I'll be getting to this, I have a lot of data on this, is we have best practices in our industry, right? Let's name some best practices. Uh, security in the QA process, developer training, scanning, static analysis, right? Anybody got a few more best practices? Come on, please look me here, quick. <laughs> Threat modeling, great. What's that? Dynamic analysis, great. What was that? Code review, great. We can list all these on, but I'm going to press back and go, where is the data that says if we do these things, the metrics improve? Meaning, if we do these things and do the vulnerability volume, volumes go down, do the time to fix sh is shorten, do we get hacked less when they do any of these things? We intuitively think so, but our industry has zero data to back up this stuff. So when we go, to the business, let's just say threat modeling, let's pick on threat modeling. We should do threat modeling and invest in this because it's a best practice, because it sounds like a good idea. And the business goes, okay, how much does this cost? How much time is it gonna take me? And what do I get out of it? Show me the data. And we don't have any. You know, we, we, we might have seen it work at one company at one time, but it really, we don't really have, can measure this stuff. So what, uh, what we did was uh, a while back, and I'll get into a little bit more, is uh, so we know White Hat has outcome metrics, vulnerability data, but I didn't know we didn't know what companies were doing internally, good, bad, or otherwise, to achieve, to, to achieve those outcomes. So we surveyed them. So we can regress the controls they put in place and how it impacted the outcome. Once we can describe that if they do this, they get this outcome, I think we're in a much better position to justify their expense on us. And then the last one, the application security shortage. Is there any company here that's not hiring AppSec people? I don't think so, right? Like everybody's looking for AppSec people. So we got to bring more and more people into this space because whether you're talking threat modeling, source code reviews, 
dynamic testing, you know, threat modeling, the list goes on. We are never, with whatever tech, we are never going to eliminate in any of those classes that all the humans. We're going to need experts no matter what. We can use tech to make them more efficient, make them scale, but we're going to need tons more people coming into the space. Builders, breakers, defenders, what have you. And we're really, it's, we're really, really behind in, our, uh, in the skill set shortage out there. So we have to work on that. So uh, let's talk very briefly about the threat actors. I think most of, the, most of you guys read the same news and the same white papers that I do. Here are the broad classes of, uh, of uh, threat actors that we're aware of. We have the hacktivists, you know, lulsec, anonymous, things like that. I classify them as more the canaries in the coal mine. They hack you and they laugh at you. They're in it for, to get a political message out there. I don't pay too much attention to these guys because they're going to make their presence known. They don't cost us a lot unless you're, you know, let's say Sony or something like that. Um, I concern myself more with the organized crime guys 90% of the time and a little bit of nation state just because of my bias sampling and the customer base. So the organized crime, they're much more sinister. They will have you and not laugh at you. They're not in it for a fame, they're not in it for the message, they're in it for your money, which means your data. So they'll hack you, they'll six siphon the data, they'll steal your money, they won't tell you, and they're gonna make a ton of money and they do that, billions or so, hundreds of billions or so per year as we're told. Then you have the nation state guys, you know, and everything, I think every major state these days has an offense capability that's hacking for command and control, surveillance, economic uh, advantage, so that's all over the place. Again, read the news. And we think we might see signs of terrorist activities out there where they're trying to instill fear in a populace using a computer. So that might come. We'll see how sophisticated that they get. But I concern myself with the middle two. Now, I'm going to get into data about what sites are vulnerable to. But first, I find it helpful. I know it's a little, a little small, um, but I'll, I'll describe it uh, a bit. We want to know what areas are most affected by what type of hacking. So this comes from the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. In my opinion, it is, the, it is probably the most, well, it's probably the only required reading in our entire industry. If you haven't read anything, you read the Verizon Data Breach Report and it tells you what's going on out there. So in the right site column, you have the web application layer and on the vertical, you have uh, all the industries. So the way to read this is, is that, let's say in the IT industry, this is information, 35% of their breaches had something to do with a web application attack. Financial services is 31%. So in most industries, uh, web security ends up being the number one or number two target for the bad guys. It works. So we know websites are vulnerable, we know bad guys use it, and now we can start re uh, putting our resources uh, where they're gonna make the most impact. Um, where's the retail in here? Um, very bottom retail. Somehow only 5%. I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe because all the bad guys are going after point of sale systems. All right. So now we know broad industry, how the bad guys are breaking into, into the system. Let's dive one layer deeper. Again, this comes from the Verizon data breach report. The quote says this year, this is the last year's report. Um, they're working on the, the latest one right now. I'm helping them out. This year, organized crime became mo the most frequently seen threat actor for web applications. Now, you can start seeing these, like what does use of stolen credit cards or the use of backdoors have anything to do with web applications? I think what goes on here, and I've been talking to the Verizon guys over the years about this, if they want to attack a hard target, they SQL inject you know, some other unrelated system, they download a billion credit, uh, credit card numbers or passwords, and they use those passwords to go after their main target, So they, because password reuse is a very real thing. So that's why I see SQL injection as, a, as number three there. So what, what happens? Bad guys will target a secondary or tertiary website. They'll use that foothold to insert malware into the system that they've customized to beat the AV. They will then pivot, get access to the data they want, and extract data. And it's really just that simple. So we spend a lot of time, as we should, locking down the front door but it's not going to be enough that the bad guys are going to do an end around. And if, if you know anything about web security, you know that most companies out there have no ideas, have no idea what websites they own or what they do or who's responsible for them. So that's another large problem that is unsolved in the industry. No one knows what websites they own. So if you don't know you own it, how can you possibly secure it? Then we have other ones like remote file include, abuse of functionality. Even cross-site scripting shows up at 6.3% of the web application hacks that are in use. So a lot of people like to say, well, yeah, cross-site scripting, how bad could JavaScript be? Well, there's a number of reasons how bad it can be. But the bad guys do seem to be using it statistically in the investigations. Jeremy, I had a question. Um, what I don't see on there, maybe it's harder to read, is um, what about from the, the 
vendors and partners, a lot of times I see a lot more uh, come in from a lot of the, the vendors and partners that are out there, because maybe, maybe your perimeter is, is pretty strong, especially if you're maybe uh, uh, some, of the, some of the government places, some of the financial, those that spend more money have the ability to do so, but um, a lot of times the weaknesses are the partners, so a lot of times the partners, you don't have the time to put on the, the assessments, the, the detail there. Is that reflected in this at all? Uh, probably, I don't know for a fact, because they, what happens is in the case of Verizon, you probably know this, um, Verizon will get called and say, we've been hacked, please do an, in an incident response. They look at who the bad guys were, what they got access to, what they stole, how long they were there, what kind of malware it was, and so on and so forth. They don't, I'd have to go into the report to see if they covered it. It's hard to tell if it was a, a system that was a primary of the, of, the, of the customer or it was a third party supplier somewhere. Um, I think there's probably a healthy amount of both, but I don't, I don't know the balance there. We'd probably have to go look in the report. But we, what we do know, and uh, whether it's IoT things or whatever, the, the software that we're acquiring from others is riddled with volumes, and they may or may not fix it. <laughs> All right, so now we know what the bad guys are doing at the web application layer to some uh, general extent. Now, let's look at the broad numbers. You know, as a capitalist, right, I want to know how customers are spending their money. I want to know what they find important, and a surrogate for that is where they, where they spend. So to counteract all this cyber hacking, they're spending $75 billion on us every single year, you know, as a, as a total class, InfoSec, $75 billion a year, and it's growing about 5%. So please remember those two numbers. Current market size is $75 billion, growing at 5% per year. And you can see the, uh, the industry breakdowns on what industries are spending what. So insurance seems to be uh, spending the most, you know, whatever the case may be. But that's important. Now, got some broad numbers there. Let's get some data. This is White Hat data from our last report. I would like to, this is how many vulnerabilities of what types that we're finding in sites. This is different from what the bad guys actually use. I can tell you what websites are vulnerable to. What I can't tell you is what the bad guys are using. That comes from Verizon. What we need to do is both. I give you what's probable, they'll give you what's likely. So this right here is a likelihood top 15. Way to read this is, let's say we just take SQL injection here, it says 6%. That means 6% of the sites we tested had at least one incident of SQL injection, not an attack, one SQL, at least one SQL injection vulnerability, 6% of the sites. Uh, if you're looking at cross-site scripting, which is one of the most popular, it actually got knocked down to number three. Those numbers you know, five years ago were in the 80s and 90s. Right now, cross-site scripting in our customer base is about 47% of websites have one or more, likely a lot more, but that's the way the stats break down. I like this chart because it tells us, the, if you start from the assumption that the bad guy only needs one vulnerability to win, whether it's SQL injection, cross-site scripting, or whatever, what are the odds that a given site has these particular things? So that's our top 15 there, and it, it so, subtly changes over time. Now, it's all well and good to find a vulnerability to describe what it is and go, you know, please fix this. It's, a, it's entirely another thing for those issues to get fixed. We want to start measuring the time to fix because that represents the window of opportunity for the bad guy. So when we find vulnerabilities, vulnerability in this website, it's this bad, this is how you fix it, your responsibility is to fix it, we'll measure the delta in between. This is the average in days organized by industry. Again, the way to read this is, let's say you take the worst of the worst, the retail industry, when we find a serious vulnerability, something in PCI rating of high, critical, or urgent, the ones you really should fix, average time to fix is 227 days from initial report. Let's just keep that in mind for a moment. <laughs> All right, what's, the, what's the, uh, the best industry? Right now, for whatever reason, it's transportation, middle of the road, let's say, uh, let's say finance and insurance, 160 days. A bank is on average taking 160 days to fix a vulnerability we tell them about. Consider this for a moment. There's a lot going on in that number. It's imagine six months to fix an issue. Why do we concern ourselves with remediation? Because these numbers, while they are improving, they are terrible. We have to do better, and it's those in the room that are going to help with that. Yes, sir. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. So does this factor in compensating controls? Like for example, uh, let's take a finance and insurance, it takes them 160 days to fix a vulnerability that you found. But is that partially because maybe there's a compensating control that limits the limits what you can do with that vulnerability? Uh, great question. So from our perspective, we're, uh, we're external, external to the system. They might have a web application firewall, they might have different tripwires or whatever else. For us, we don't know 
why it's vulnerable or not vulnerable, but it's exposed or it's not exposed. Like it's vulnerable or it's not. Now there are small caveats to that. If we're able to use a vault and steal money, they might have some back office business control that will prevent the check from going out or something like that. So they might have that control, but I would say generally these are accurate. 99% of the time, you know, hit burp sweet and you will. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. That's a total, why the why the bones take so long to fix. I don't have great data on that because it's it's a combination of a whole bunch of things. It might be developers aren't tasked. No one owns the website. They don't understand the issue. Um, they sit in there. You know, there's a million reasons. I don't have great data on why they don't fix or why it takes so long. Yeah, that would be like the next layer down. I first had to measure these, and I can go okay. Every time I do stats, it's always like, well, why? <laughs> it's like keep going down. But it's a great question. I, I really don't know. Um, I will get some insights because I do have some data later on that drives towards why vulnerability or vulnerabilities are fixed at all. So, but yes, sir. Um, how much of that is quality, you know, QA? So, for instance, uh, it takes, you know, once Microsoft's uh, aware of, a, of an issue, it takes them six months to go through the QA cycle. I have a number of clients where their typical QA cycle is three to six months because they're doing various testing of it. It could be. Would that be so I should explanation also, for some of this? Yeah, I should also uh, point out, these are, 99% of them are non-CVE vulnerabilities. These are custom web application flaws, which shouldn't come under the normal, like, you know, ship software, get everybody in the world to patch sort of thing. These are not things in, like, Outlook and you know, things like that. These are mostly websites. Um, but still, there could be a QA process. Our company pushes four times a year. And we only get those windows, and that's that. There, there is a lot of that same kind of play. It's just they're not CVEs. Yeah. So this is for 2015 data. I I'm said? sorry. This is 2014 data. 14? I just got access to all the 2015 data, and the numbers are not substantially. And when did you first? I mean, what were the numbers like when you first measured this? I mean, how you say they, they they've improved, but has it been a factor? Uh, probably about 20 percent overall, all except retail and trade. Okay. Retail and trade seems to be getting worse. Worse, even with all the new PCI. PCI doesn't work. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, sorry. I mean, it actually makes the problem worse, if anything else, because PCI says go after the top 10. Bad guys don't go, say go, bad guys don't care about the OS top 10. They can care less. They don't care what vulnerability they, they can exploit. So what happens is when you get compliance, the compliance says focus on these issues and discount the rest. And you're exposed all the time. And let me drive into that one to show you what's going on out there. So the way to read this is, this is window of exposure. Again, if we start from the point, we have to make, we have to always remember our job is to keep these websites from getting hacked, and not necessarily just find and fix vulnerabilities as an academic exercise. We're trying to keep someone, a sentient being, outside the system. And we have to find all vulnerabilities at all times because they only need one to win. We have to do find all at all times. So the way to read this is, how many days of the year was the business exposed or that website exposed to at least one exploitable vulnerability? The way to read this is, and that's the finance and insurance space, that says 39% of the websites we tested in 2014 had at least one serious exposed vuln every single day of the year. There wasn't a single day where they didn't have at least one. And let's say retail and trade, it was 60% of them. I would love somebody from the council to explain this to me, how PCI is making a damn bit of difference. Right? It doesn't, and there are people getting hurt as a result of this. The, the entire incentives are in the wrong direction. It's not making a difference. They're spending a, a lot more money, but it's not working. There's good news in this. So now, the grays are the ones that are not doing so good, but the ones in teal <laughs> are doing much better. So there are 17% of the banking websites that have a serious vulnerability exposed less than 30 days of the year. So when we want to learn about what works and what doesn't work, we want to compare those who seem to be doing a good job and compare it against those who are not. This seems to be a rational way to go about, you know, how to improve web security when we start learning from each other. So when I get on the phone, I get on the phone with the, with the guys in Teal and going, what are you guys doing? Like, something's working there and I would like to replicate it. Any questions? Sorry. I call my pretty strong on PCI. <laughs> yeah. The only reason it's not really working is because the incentives are in the wrong place. Uh, you have the processors that are incentivized to have more processing, so they'll give you extensions, and you have the council that generate an income from it. So it's maybe it's not a lot of income. Maybe they don't care. I, I don't. I don't know how. I don't know what exactly the problem is. I just know 
the improvements are not showing up in the numbers. I play the part of the bad guy, right? We simulate the bad guy and it's not moving. All right, now, we've talked a lot about bones, how often people are exposed. Let's talk dollars, losses, because the businesses, the CFO, CIO, CEO, board, they like talking numbers and dollar losses. Back to Verizon data breach report, this is loss ranges that they've seen from their investigations organized by number of records. So the way to read this is if you go down, you know, most of the way down to 1 million records, if you get 1 million records stolen, your expected loss is 1.2 million. So depending on the organi your organization or those that you work with, you can tell the business that if we get hacked, if we lose our data, whether it's credit card numbers or people's personal information, these are, this is going to be our expected loss. It's going to be difficult to describe likelihood. I'd say we have this number of vulnerabilities. If one of them is exploited, it costs us a million records, it's gonna cost us X. Therefore, we should spend X amount of security dollars to prevent that from happening. These are just the hard losses, not brand damage and things like that. These losses will be uh, fines, downtime, cleanup, investigation, lawsuits, and things like that. These are the hard losses. So that's the zone we have to be looking at. That's, that's what's at risk. As a net result of all this, actually, before we go to that slide, there is a sense of apathy out there in the industry amongst uh, the enterprises out there. So you, you start, let, let's, yeah, actually, let's just go into the survey. This was very interesting to me. The, the survey said, in 2014, 71% of security professionals said their networks were breached. Three quarters of them said they were breached. About a quarter of them said they were victimized six or more times. This problem reoccurs for them. You know, it's kind of like a, it's a yearly thing. <laughs> Um, and, it's, and, the, and it's going up. So you know, every year is year of the hack. We, you know, we, what was that first term? I first saw it in 2011, then I saw it again in 2012. Every year is the year of the hack now, right? It just keep, the problem seems to be getting worse. So now, um, here's where the apathy comes in. Check this one out, the one in the white there. 52% of those surveys said their organizations will likely be successfully hacked in the next 12 months. Consider that for a moment. You're, you're a director of security, you've been asked a question, what do you think the odds are you're gonna get hacked? More than half of them said, we're likely gonna get hacked in the next year, and there's probably not a lot I can do about it. I mean, that signals something very dire to us. I mean, the head of security doesn't know how to secure the system. Now, yes, sir. Or the, you know, motivation, the dollars. I still, well, I, I still would count, I don't know how, I don't know how to motivate the business to do it. Or it's not, maybe, I don't know, I know the controls that'll likely work, but I don't know how to get them implemented, get the organization to have the necessary fortitude to do it. So they're looking for help, but that, whatever the case, that is their state of mind. So now if you're thinking to yourself, I don't know all my websites I own, I'm riddled with bones, the losses are there, I'm probably gonna get hacked. What do you do? And if you're in what what do you do as a business? What do you do as a security professional? You know, on, on the enterprise. So again, I follow the dollars. What are people doing? What are they spending money on? They start spending money on insurance. Imagine this for a moment. Instead of spending dollars on more security controls, more training, or whatever, they spend money on Lloyd's of London. Right. So let, let's look at these numbers real quick here. Um, the numbers right now, I'll, I'll, I'll bridge this, you know, for the sake of time. Right now, cyber insurance premiums, the money you pay to insure to get your protection, is $3 billion annually in premiums. For the last three years that I've been tracking it, it's been growing somewhere between 60 and 70% annually. Remember for a moment, cyber security is at 75 billion, growing at 5%. Cyber insurance is growing at 60%, it's already at $3 billion. They're more than the new dollars going into security, cybersecurity, is not going into preventative medicine. It's going into insurance. That signals a very real credibility problem for our entire industry where they figure downside protection is more viable than buying more upside. Yes, uh, there's a question back there. Isn't that what we do at home though? I mean, don't we spend more on our sort of house insurance than on bars and windows? Uh, one more time, please. Sorry? Oh, do you want me to repeat it? Yes, please. Oh, sorry. I isn't that what we do at home, though? Don't we spend more on home insurance than on bars and windows? Uh, so next, but if you do that, your insurance premiums go way up. You can have no lock on your door. You're going to pay another 20% in home insurance premiums when they investigate your house. True. true. But, I, I mean, but, but a lock... Too late. Oh. Sorry. Hmm? Insurance is too late. The 
data is already gone. So what, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting here, you guys are probably all right. What I'm suggesting here, this is not a right or wrong you should or should not do. I merely point out the fact that this is what the conversation is going to be in the next three to five years. You're going to need to know these numbers because I guarantee you as security professionals, you're going to get the, the questionnaire from your insurer and going, what are all the things that you're doing? And in a very short moment of time, they're going to start telling you what to buy. Yes, sir. Is this happening in the insurance and IT and in, I guess business insurance for properties, they'll send inspectors out to the business, inspect the building, tell them you got to fix these things, we will not insure you. Will the insurance company start they already are. Security? They already are. It's already happening. It's very slight. It's very small. Only five minutes. Oh crap. Okay. Um, well, well, how much time? Well, this time how much time? We'll, we'll keep. We'll keep going. Okay. All right. So these are the conversations we're going to be having out there. And so our masters are not going to be PCI counsel and things like that. It's going to be the insurers that are out there and say you will buy this firewall and configure it like this because it's statistically shown to work. So. Let's look at some of the, insur the, the insurance playouts that we see out there in the industry. So this is Target. Everybody knows about the Target breach. Their cost that they said was at nearly a quarter of a billion dollars. They did have cyber insurance, and it paid out $90 million to them. Home Depot, another hack out there, 43, uh, 43 million in losses. Their insurer, their insurer covered 15 million of it. So consider this for a moment. So people have cyber insurance. They are making claims. They are making payouts. And if anything, if anything the companies that are buying insurance are not buying enough insurance. Let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> now, who's offering this cyber insurance stuff? There's only about 50 suppliers out there. I have a whole archive of questionnaires because what happens is, is that uh, the CFO of the company goes, I want cyber insurance. This insurer gives you a large questionnaire and detailing your entire IT environment. They pass that questionnaire to the CIO or the CSO. You answer every single question about your IT environment and then they give you a premium and this is the result. So this is all the companies, well, this is a snapshot that are offering cyber insurance. It's the wild west out there. There really are no standards. It's really difficult to know how they price this stuff, but here we are. Yes, sir. They have no actuarials. Very, very small. I think what's going on, this is just my theory, what's going on is they're pricing the premiums really high, expecting the claims to come in. They have all the control data from the questionnaires and after they do the investigations, they'll, they'll smash it together and correlate. That's it. They'll take the losses for now to such an extent because later they're going to know statistically what works and what doesn't work in a way that we never could. Yeah, what's interesting is some of those companies that are my clients, they themselves are not. Well, one more time, sir. Yeah. Some of those Some of those listed as insurers are my clients. They, they, they themselves are insecure, substantially insecure. So it's interesting that they're offering insurance on things that they themselves probably have to get insurance reinsurance from. <laughs> oh, um, I'm really curious because you know Target stock went up. It did. And so I think, and I ask you this question, is the fact that the stock price isn't damaged, which means these... C-suites bonuses aren't damaged when they use insurance is really the mediating thing why they would rather use sure insurance than uh, tighten up their ship. That's a good question. I really don't know the answer to that one. Uh, that's more a question for Wall Street. I'm security for all. I try to keep people not from getting hacked. I just try to follow the dollars the best I can. The target CEO was forced to resign. What was his bonus? <laughs> He, he got a nice big golden parachute, but he still didn't want to leave that company. He worked his way up from a cashier. So you're right that over the long term, their stock price didn't, you know, continued to grow, but there was definitely a short term hit that affected so, so, so for the sake of time, we're going to have a great hallway track. Believe it. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's, let me give you one more try. Just to give you a, a sense of uh, proportion of what's going on out there. The top one, the application security market of which we are all a part, is about $1 billion annually. It's growing at about 15%, depending on who you ask. Cyber insurance, like I said, as a comparison, is already 3 billion in, 3 .3 to 3.2 billion in premium, growing at 60 to 70%. And as compared to all of InfoSec, which is the new, the new spend on InfoSec is 3.8 billion, growing at five. You see where the dollars are lining up now. So what I talk up to a, a lot of my peers about in the industry is, to solve application security, we have all the answers but no one's investing in it for whatever the reason. We have to grow the industry somehow, some way, because we have the answer. We know how to make breaches less because all the risk is in apps. 
but for some reason, we, our message on the value that we're providing hasn't been uh, carried forward. But I, it signals to me that the entire infosec is a large credibility issue. So how do we get it back? Now, the last thing I'll harp on is that as RSA comes up, right, and you're going to have 700 pre-IPO vendors all vying for your attention, have you ever noticed that everything sold in all of InfoSec has no guarantees, no warranties, and no insurance policies? We don't buy cars that way. We don't buy houses that way. We don't buy watches that way. We don't buy Barbie dolls that way, right? Nothing. But a $75 billion industry, ours, operates like a gigantic garage sale where all sales are final. This is horrible. And we can do better. There are ways. Yes, sir. Also, software and security. Exactly right. And I don't think there's any good reason for that. So I missed my slide, so I was kind of caught, caught in a moment. Now, if you type in security guarantee into your favorite search engine, you're going to get these results that come up. When these banks are trying to attract new clients, they'll say, well, customers are concerned about you know, losing their money if they bank on them. If the customer's account is taken over, they lose money. These businesses will refund your money. Somehow, some way, these companies are using products with no guarantees to guarantee the security of their customers. They are able to do it. Why can't we? Right? And so I'll go into this. I'll share with you a little bit about why that does, but I want to be you know, very uh, respectful of uh, the podium here. But this is uh, Dan Gear. If you haven't read Dan Gear, he's great stuff. Um, the only two products not covered by product liability are, are, are religion and software, and software should not escape much longer. So, as not to be uh, hypocritical in this, in this whole thing, so White Hat, our, our mission in life is to find vulnerabilities that a bad guys will eventually exploit. If the customers will fix the vulnerabilities we say, they should not get hacked. That's, that's the claim, that's the whole idea of everybody's vulnerability assessment program. We just decided to guarantee it. So we know what we're able to find, we know what we're able to miss, and we know how often that occurs. So we said, if we screw up, we'll give you your money back and we'll cover the first half million of your breach costs. That's what we did. We know our metrics. And I encourage, and I'm happy to teach any other vendor that would like to know how we did it and how they go about the process to guarantee the claims that they make in their marketing, they can do that. We did it, you can do it, you can too. And the second thing I really want the enterprises out there, the customers of everything else vendors to do, is to start asking your vendors to guarantee their outlandish marketing claims. When they say no false positives, all viruses, right? Make them guarantee it. Just ask the question. They can if you force them to. You have all the power. We have none. Your dollars matter. Please ask them. All right. One more, uh, one more set of slides here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I started comparing because when we do all this stuff, because I want to know statistically if what we're recommending works. So what we did was we surveyed all of our customers, asked them 16 questions, on all the controls in their software security program. And we regressed them against all the 2014 vulnerability data we had on them. So for instance, we asked them, uh, what were their, uh, in the event of breach, what part of the organization will be held to account? 9% said board of directors, 29% said executive management, so on and so forth. So if you're in the security department and your company gets breached, one in three chance that you're gonna get blamed. Now, when it comes to, if you correlate that to vulnerability data, how does it work? So again, let's say, now here's where it gets interesting, and it'll add a whole lot to the discussion. Um, when the board of directors, when the, when, they, when the customer said board of directors is held to account in the event of breach, they had an average number, they had uh, an average of 10 vulnerabilities. When the security department was said to be accountable in the event of breach, they found 25. There's two ways to look at this. One, you could say, well, when the board of directors top to top is accountable, the site is more secure versus when the security team is responsible for it. There's another way to look at it. When the security team is responsible, they do a much better job at all the testing, right? There's two ways to look at this. So it's hard to read into it a bit. But the average time to fix, same kind of thing. Um, when the board of directors was uh, held accountable, 129 days to fix, security department, 114 days, but it didn't seem to affect the remediation rate. Uh, uh, this one strikes with the gentleman's earlier question here. What are the drivers for resolving website vulnerabilities at all? In prior years, 2013 and back, one of the main drivers was compliance. The number one driver in compliance was, the number one driver to fix vulnerabilities was compliance. Now it's risk reduction at 35%. So one in three, 
companies that we work with, they say the number one issue is to you know, reduce risk. Great, let's correlate that. When the main driver is risk reduction, you would find the largest number of vulnerabilities. It's kind of weird, huh? They're probably really going after it. Versus, let's say, uh, where is it, compliance? Half that. Compliance is only gonna ask you to find what's on their list and no more. And then you also see it impacts remediation rates and time to fixes. So these policies will matter. Now I'm gonna give you one more slide here and say, when you start lining these up, I wanna describe three metrics here. Number of volumes, time to fix, and remediation rates. And we start lining up these controls. For instance, if you want your number of open vulnerabilities to improve, it would seem, if it seems in the data, static analysis drops the average number of vulnerabilities. But it does not seem to improve remediation rates. Similar can be said of, let's say, QA, uh, adversar adversarial testing in the QA environment. It helps number of volumes, it helps remediation rate, but not time to fix. So here's the lesson that we've been learning in this. There are no best practices. It's hit that slide there. There are no best practices. You, it, when you understand your metrics and which one you want to improve, number of volumes, time to fix remediation rates, you should enact the control most likely to affect that outcome. I've not found a security control yet where it, where it measurably improves all statistics at all times. You might have a training problem, you might not. You might have a QA problem, you might not. I'll give you one uh, contrived example of this. Let's say we take site A and it has 100 vulnerabilities when they're found, they're fixed fast and they're fixed often, right? Very fast, they're fixed within a day, and all of them are fixed. You take site B, site B has 10 times fewer vulnerabilities, let's say 10, but they're always exposed, they're slow to fix, things like that. So what's going on here? In the site A that has a ton of vulns, they're fixing them fast and often. That means prioritization is in the right place and they know how to fix them. Why do they have so many vulnerabilities? Maybe it's a QA issue, framework issue, they turned off the .NET you know, request validators or something like that, that might be one of the issues. In the case where it's, very, it's 10 times less vulnerabilities, you say 10 times less secure, that's not what the bad guy thinks because he just needs one on any given day. That might be a training issue because when a vuln's exposed, they might not know how to fix it. It might be a business priority issue where the, they say developers work on features and not vulnerabilities. So there's a lot more going on in application security than just saying best practices. So the first step in all this is understand your metrics and then pick the control most likely to affect the outcomes. And the last thing I'll say on this is the reason I've been doing this over 15 years is that I've, I've said it many times, the web of which we're all a part, everyone will be, every one of us will be on it today, probably everyone we know will be on it today. It's a, it's, the web has got to be the single greatest invention we'll see in our lifetime. It connects over two billion people. We bank, we shop, we pay our bills. It's how we learn, it's how we got here, it's how we registered. It affects every single part of our life. I don't think, and I think spending the last 15 years and maybe the next 15, helping to secure that thing is a, is a worthwhile way to spend one's life. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, time. you wanna take any more questions? Four minutes, you have questions? Yes, sir. So sorry I didn't do that. Um, I have a question. Don't you think that our weaponry is not good enough to protect against those threats? Right? Apparently, like you cannot do security assessment and find cryptographic backdoor or something like that. It's gotta be uh, very and, tough. And uh, like the question is, what can we do? Yeah, it's gonna be very tough to. Uh, it's gonna be tough for any company to defend themselves against China and the amount of money that they're spending. It's going to be very tough. In those particular occasions, uh, if you're a uh, the way I like to present it is if you're, there's two types of victims or targets, target of opportunity, target of choice. If you're a target of opportunity, then you should get your security posture just above average and then the bad guy will shift their attack to go hit your, ne your next door neighbor or something like that, right? If you're a target of, uh, of choice, the bad guy is going to come after you nonstop, then you're going to have to be as secure as you can, reasonably, and then you have to get very fast at detection and response. If you give us any hacker, bad guy, root access on a bank for an hour, we're not going to steal any money. It's far too complicated uh, to do it. So if you can find, do fast detection and response after the bad guy spent you know, six months and a million dollars and to only get checked off in an hour, that's probably what you're going for there. So one, uh, I think, silver lining for the cyber insurance, because I've had to fill out those questionnaires multiple times, is 
that uh, the executives also see those questions like largely before they're submitted. So they say, hey, do you have somebody in charge of security? Hey, do you have the a firewall uh, testing? So I think it's priming those executives and saying like, oh, we don't have any of these controls. Yes, the questionnaire will be submitted. Yes, the premium will be paid. But I think th there is a benefit that they see all those questions that not only the security team, but insurance companies are saying, not that that changes any of the dimensions there. Excellent. Was there one question over here? Yeah, so question about the threat acting situation. Like, you notice that there's a question mark next to terrorists? Yeah. So uh, there was a question mark next to terrorists, right? So uh, how do you, wh where would you quantify the threat actor for the recent uh, power uh, power outage in the Ukraine then? If not terrorism, what was that? That might have been nation state. It might have been terrorists. I try not to get too wrapped up in the uh, in the semantics of it, but it, it seems like whoever the threat actors are, they're going after power grids and dropping systems for a variety of reasons. We've not seen the full, a full investigation report on a who done it and how, so we can kind of just guess. I, I could guess, but it's only going to be a guess. Okay, because I mean, I would just imagine that as uh, as terrorists themselves come online and start learning more about SCADA vulnerabilities and things like that, that then uh, that actually does become they have they have similar goals to nation state in terms of disabling infrastructure of their enemies. That's all. And SQL Map is going to get easier for them to use. All good. Thank you very much. I'll be around if any more questions. Thank you very much for your time.